Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Reuters Institute um, webinar. Uh, my name is Federica Cherubini. I'm director of the leadership development activities at the Reuters Institute, and I'm very happy today to be moderating this um, conversation um, about how publishers are creating news um, on TikTok. We'll hear from Nick Newman, who's a senior research associate at the Institute and a consultant in digital media. And he'll discuss and present us the main findings of his um, recent report um, on the adoption of TikTok amongst news publishers and how the publishers and independent journalists and creators are using the platform um, to reach younger audiences um, and how the platform could be better support um, trusted journalism. Um, so, Nick, um, over to you. We'll start with a presentation and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so you can post your question uh, and then we'll, we'll get started after the presentation. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Federica, um, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's really good to, to have you join us um, for this webinar. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I'm going to set out sort of the, the sort of key findings of the research probably in about um, 25 minutes or so. I think this is one of the first attempts to, to map what publishers are doing on TikTok. And in this report, we analyze data from publisher accounts in 44 countries. Uh, we've also interviewed 20 of the leading publishers, some of the early adopters, about their motivations and their strategies. Uh, I should also say that is a, it's still a, a really small sample of all the activity on TikTok. So we should really see this as a snapshot, particularly because this is such a fast moving area and the, you know, the nature of news, the way it surfaced is changing all the time. Um, but before we get into the publisher data, um, just a little bit of, of, of context. You know, why did we write this report on TikTok now, um, and why does it matter to um, to to a lot of people? Why are so many people joining this webinar, for example? So this is part of the reason. This this is essentially uh, a slide from our digital news report data showing explosive growth in usage of TikTok across a few countries. Uh, so this is audience survey data, essentially. Uh, and you can see that very rapid growth, particularly in countries with, with younger populations like Brazil. It's worth pointing out the numbers are still much smaller than uh, Facebook or YouTube um, in general. But if you focus on demographics, then it, it's a really different story. So TikTok usage is really focused on the youngest cohort, uh, under 25s or even younger uh, in our digital news report data, 40% of 18 to 24s uh, across 40 countries or so say they use it now for any purpose. Uh, that's the blue, and 15% say they use it for news. Uh, it's interesting that the age profile is actually getting a little bit older. It's certainly older than it was a few years ago, but it's still very much uh, focused on that youth audience, which is very hard for traditional publishers to reach. And um, news is also much more important than it was uh, even a year ago. So as this quote says, you know, it's not just about uh, dancing uh, videos these days. Uh, it's also where news is broken. It's where news is discussed. It's where news is shared. And part of the reason for that is uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, before that COVID. So this was really when news started to become much more part of the conversations on TikTok. Um, it also, by the way, provided um, a sort of uh, a reason for some of the biggest publishers like the BBC, for example, to go on to TikTok um, to sort of combat misinformation and to start their TikTok activity. Uh, and then the other reason is that it matters, <clears throat> that focusing on TikTok matters and vertical video matters is because it is changing the whole social media ecosystem. The success of TikTok is influencing other networks. So this chart, again, from our digital news report, again, this is looking at the networks used by 18 to 24s. Uh, and what you see is this sort of relatively dramatic decline, actually, in Facebook usage for any purpose with that 18 to 24s and uh, that very fast rise of TikTok. Uh, so on current trends, we would expect TikTok to overtake Facebook next year with that youngest group. Um, and in turn, that is changing the strategy of Facebook. It's changing uh, Instagram as well and, and YouTube in terms of their focus on um, entertainment, on creators um, and 
on uh, vertical video as well. So I think this is just a, a big sort of shift, uh, not just for TikTok, but also more widely. So to, to, to the data and the research that we've done sort of uh, specifically for this, I'm about to show you new data um, mapping that publisher activity on TikTok in different countries. And what we did was we identified the top publishers in each country from our digital news report lists. And then we checked whether each of those publishers had posted news related content in the last week and when they started their um, TikTok activity to, to sort of understand really what was going on uh, across those countries. And just a sort of uh, a headline, where in the world are we seeing most activity? <clears throat> what we see is very strong adoption. So the darker colors essentially are where we, we see a bigger percentage of those top news providers um, with TikTok accounts. Uh, and that is primarily Western Europe. So France, Spain, the UK, <clears throat> excuse me, also Southeast Asia, very strong there, Latin America and the United States. Um, and you can see that, you know, Indonesia, for example, 90% of the top publishers were uh, are on TikTok. Compare that with uh, some countries in Southern Europe, like Italy, only 29%, maybe Federica can explain why. And then um, uh, Eastern Europe, it's also, in some Eastern European countries, also a lot lower. So countries like Bulgaria, just 7% of, of publishers. Um, so overall, 49%, about half of publishers are already on TikTok and 51% are not. Uh, why are many of them have, have joined in the last year? What, what are the main reasons? So firstly, um, that younger audience. So um, this Gen Z audience is increasingly not going directly to websites and apps. And so this is a way of, of engaging them and starting a conversation. Uh, secondly, experimentation. So I talked earlier about the sort of growing importance of vertical video and, and TikTok is just a really good place to experiment, to see what works, uh, and then to apply that actually to other social networks or even to your own website. Uh, thirdly, that concern about the need to counter uh, misinformation uh, with reliable news as the network grows. And then finally, and uh, importantly, that sort of fear of missing out. So many publishers um, have been late to the party with other social networks, and they've seen that other people have have got a, an advantage by being there earlier. And so that sort of is, is another core, core reason, I think. Uh, over half are still not there, and we did also talk to some who who had not um, had decided specifically not to go onto TikTok, and that includes many public media companies, uh, New York Times, a lot of um, publishers have decided not to go onto TikTok. Uh, <clears throat> at the top of that list is concerns about Chinese ownership. Um, so um, that's partly about the fear that content may be. Uh, suppressed or um, uh, may uh, certain sensitive subjects may be demoted. I mean, these are potential fears. There's there's not a lot of evidence it's happened, but also data security that that um, that the data of the youth of the West is being analysed or has the potential to be analysed by authorities in China, for example. And there's a lot of um, I think we'll see a lot more scrutiny over that issue over the next year as well. We're already seeing action in the US. Uh, then I think the second sort of key reason is that for many, um, particularly subscription publications, but also advertising publications, there's, there's very little monetization. And so that's really limiting investment. Um, and particularly at this moment when there's a lot of concern about um, layoffs in the, in the media industry, people are really looking for return on investment. And then um, other people are just focusing on other audiences, you know, maybe slightly older, maybe millennials. Um, using Snip, uh, Instagram and Snapchat and these these kind of things. So so you know there are there are it's worth remembering as we talk about TikTok that um, over half of publishers are still not on TikTok. Um, so let's move on now to um, to look at the, um, the 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 brands and the publishers and who's doing best in terms of first of all follow accounts, and um, these are the brands, the news brands in Europe, first of all, that have the highest fo uh, follower count. So 4.2 million people are following the Daily Mail. Um, and you can see the list there is dominated by a lot of uh, big traditional media brands, but we've also got a lot of uh, what we call digital 
diverse brands or socially native brands, so brands who are either only operate on social or have that as part of their DNA, like Actuality, Vice World News, Brute in France, Fan Page in Italy, really started in social media. So it's it's sort of really core to them, and you can see how well they're 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 doing. If you look at the United States, it's a sort of similar trend. <clears throat> now this, which is a, a digital first brand, has 5.5 million. That's the, the the largest we could find. But you also see some of the traditional um, networks doing very well as well, ABC, uh, NBC, and CBS. Um, we should say we only included brands who were doing mainly news or a significant amount of news. <clears throat> so we excluded entertainment and sports brands as well. This is a global phenomenon, so I've focused on Europe and the United States, but uh, you can see really big numbers in Indonesia, in much of the rest of Asia Pacific. Thailand has very, very high numbers as well. Interestingly, a lot of these brands are television brands that are really taking television content and just putting it onto TikTok. So there's not, not a lot of effort in sort of reversioning some of that content in some of these parts of the world. And then Latin America, not surprisingly, Brazil, we saw it already, you know, a lot of consumer interest and a lot of publisher interest as well. Argentina, Mexico, so these big sort of uh, population countries which have a long tradition in social media are also there uh, very early. So this is this is truly a, a global phenomenon. Now, large follower counts on TikTok in particular is not necessarily a guarantee of success. So we, we also wanted to understand, you know, engagement um, on the platform. So to what extent do those big follower counts carry through into engagement at an individual video level? So I've reordered essentially the top news brands across 44 countries into the, the the average views per TikTok post. And what you see here is NBC News at the top there. So each of the videos has views of around a million, um, which is you know really significant numbers. Um, you can see G1 Globo, which is a global publication in Brazil, 784,000 per post. Uh, this was during the Brazilian elections. We were looking at this and some of them were getting five, 10 million views for a short post about politics, for example. So this is not just entertainment content. This is <clears throat> serious news content. Uh, yeah, very, very large numbers for, for some of those at the top of the list. But you can see that the engagement level goes down in some of those bigger um, brands that, we, that had high follow accounts. So it doesn't necessarily follow that if you have a high follow account, you're going to get really big engagement. And a lot of this goes back to the extent to which you're prepared to really change the format and really be native to the platform. And so generally the ones on the left are the ones where people are putting in bespoke effort. The ones on the right are where they're doing a bit more reversioning in general. So that's the big picture, the, the sort of big numbers, if you like. Um, but beyond that, what are the strategies that are being pursued? And uh, broadly, we find two approaches. So firstly, a creator-led approach, which is essentially um, a publisher will employ young people who understand the platform to create um, bespoke content. And then secondly, you have a newsroom-led strategy, which essentially takes existing faces and correspondence and then sort of reversions a lot of that content. So firstly, example of the creator led uh, probably the best known example of the creator led approach is the washington post so originally it was just dave jorgensen uh, the washington post TikTok guy and what you see here is one of his trademark comedy sketches um so this is a story he did a, a couple of months ago about shrink inflation uh in the packaging of sweets and he used halloween to uh to talk about the story you can see the disappointment on the face of the uh of the young trick and treater who sees these tiny little sweet packets and so dave kind of explaining how shrink inflation uh works and um uh as you can see here um dave jorgensen is using comedy because he says it's really part of the dna of tiktok um, but what they're trying to do is take a serious issue and, and explain it in an accessible way that is true to the platform. But it's also interesting that as the as the platform matures and audience expectations change, there is more sort of traditional news, uh, news literacy uh, going on as well. So this was a piece that he did uh, recently about uh, voting in the midterm elections, for example, um, 
but also the teams got very heavily involved in uh, debunking, for example, uh, misinformation around around Ukraine and getting people to tag the team. So helping people essentially navigate fact from fiction, they see now as an absolutely key part of their of their mission. So you kind of engage people first, but it's also got a really really uh, serious purpose to it. Um, many other newspapers are, are kind of taking a similar approach. So the LA Times recently set up what it calls a creator team, which includes, <clears throat> you can see them all here, an artist, uh, filmmakers, cartoonists, there's even a puppeteer. Um, and again, experimenting with more accessible formats to, to get to not just young people, but hard to reach audiences in general. This is the puppet. It's called, it's a sheep. It's called um, Judith. And um, it does a little uh, series, which comes out, I think, twice a week, which is about the environment. And it always starts with, we're sorry to report that. But there's a lot of humor involved, again, um, using comedy and humor to tell these difficult stories. And when you talk to Angie Jamie, who's the head of creative content, probably the first head of creative content that I've come across in the news industry, um, I asked her, you know, why, why, you know, aren't you trivializing it? Isn't TikTok trivializing these important stories and say, you know, essentially says you've got to laugh in order to survive, which is a very Gen Z thing. And so this is this is kind of a natural way to um, to take in information, but also to, to laugh at the same time. Uh, and then <clears throat> here's another example from France. So Le Monde has gone again for this bespoke creator approach to try and, um, so the mission is to explain the news, but using uh, a whole load of techniques here, you can see metaphors, drawing, fake video games, acting to try and explain things. Um, and here's just an example. It just gives you a sense, I guess, of how fast some of these things are and how uh, they're really, they're really, um, uh, focused on that that younger audience and those expectations. Yeah, so <clears throat> really, really fast moving, incredibly creative, um, grabbing people's attention at the beginning, but again, with that kind of serious purpose. That's a long way from, you know, traditional television content, I think. It's really something very different. Um, on the other hand, uh, so this is the second approach. So the second approach is the brand or newsroom-led approach, and I'm going to use Sky News as the illustration of this. So they argue they have, you know, a lot of journalism. They have a, a huge amount of video and TikTok is essentially just another way to distribute that. So uh, we have, they say we have, you know, these experienced foreign correspondents like Stuart Ramsey, who's right on the ground when Ukraine is being invaded. So why don't we get him to tell the story rather than a young creator uh, somewhere miles away to do it? It makes much more sense. Uh, they did another one with the Texas school shooting, which was seen by, I think this one was seen by 10 million um, Texas school shooting was seen by something like 39 um, million people. Uh, so they have sort of four pillars of their strategy, essentially, of four things they found really work. So firstly, the idea of eyewitness journalism and also sort of, uh, you know, their access to big politicians or celebrities. Secondly, being first with breaking news moments. Um, so I think one of the uh, sort of keys there is if you are, if you have um, really strong pictures. Uh, in many cases, many different media organizations will have the same pictures. But if you are first with those, the TikTok algorithm really gives you much more traction and demotes the other ones. So being first on the on the sort of the, 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 the pictures of the day, if you like, is absolutely crucial. Explainers, we've kind of talked about that already, and you've seen some examples of sort of explaining the news, which work, works really well for that younger audience. And then live broadcasts, um, Sky got 16 million people for their live coverage of the Queen's, Queen's funeral. Not a lot of people know that TikTok also does live uh, videos as well as short one minute uh, versions. Another example of the brand led approach um, is The Economist. And it's, you know, a lot of people say that to make it work on TikTok, you have to have faces, you have to have personalities. And of course, The Economist doesn't use faces, it has no bylines at all. And so, um, this is a bit of a challenge for them 
Um, but the way they've approached it is really to make the brand and the styling the star. And so to bring that sort of consistency and the wit that they 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 use throughout their journalism to play in a different environment. Uh, they have again a, a whole sort of whole load of things they do. So many of their videos start with a simple question: How did chickens get so big, for example? And they choose particular subjects that they think are really going to resonate with that with that audience. So, you know, for example, factory farming is 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 a big issue. And that one, I think, now has five million views. How do chickens get so big? And then they commissioned a follow up to it. Um, so, again, it's kind of listening and iterating and pulling that back. Um, here's Liv Maloney. You know, we're never going to be the first. So, so they're unlike Sky, they're not trying to, to be the first with breaking news. That's not what their brand is about. It's about explaining geopolitics and economics. So we're going to be the best place to have that explained. So really clear purpose. And then... Uh, you know, taking into account the, the different environments. And then one final approach to mention is uh, the individual correspondent or reporter. So there, there are not that many individual correspondents, partly because it takes a lot of time. It's not as simple as doing a Twitter feed, for example. But this is Max Foster, who um, uh, works for CNN as an anchor and reporter. Um, and he's been on TikTok right since the beginning because he saw his uh, teenage son using TikTok and he really wanted to understand what was going on. Uh, he has a, a million followers, which is pretty much as many followers as the entire CNN brand, all on his own. Um, and he does serious stuff. He does playful stuff. He's changed his approach a lot. Um, but he's really sort of he really understands the platform and the expectations. So this one about what happens to the Queen's corgis after she died. Uh, got 4.1 million and he's you know his his point which is encouraging for people like me is you don't need to be old to to work on tiktok sorry you don't need to be young to work on tiktok um and actually when it comes to news maybe people will listen to experienced correspondents people who who look a bit older um rather than you know they might not listen to older people when it comes to musical taste but when it comes to news um the brand and the personal brand matters a bit more so just to summarize um, the sort of different approaches we find. Um, so we've got um, a, a creator led approach on, on the left. You've got a brand led approach on the right. You've got that sort of sense that some uh, content is really focusing on information and explanation. Others is a bit more fun, maybe a bit more comedy. And without wishing to overgeneralize, what we find is that big broadcasters tend to be in this top right quadrant uh, this brand-led information space because they've got a lot of video assets. So they're really essentially repurposing those assets. Yes, they're taking a bit more, um, they're, they're versioning them a bit, that some are trying a, a slightly different agenda, but broadly that's that's the approach that most broadcasters have taken. Uh, then you have correspondence, the quick take. So, um, you know, essentially a lot of it is serious and informative but they're also um, trying to be more playful and to understand the platform as well. Uh, then you have um, socially native and newspaper brands because they don't have video assets. Um, one of the things they've done is sort of bring in those new, those people with the right skills. So they brought in the creators and they're doing a lot more experimentation in general um, as, as we saw earlier. And then finally you've got sort of popular brands where actually TikTok really fits quite well, the sort of celebrity um, uh, led, led agenda that many of them pursue, but also they they do some really good accessible political videos. And again, some of them are doing more of a brand led approach. Some of them are, are pushing more into employing uh, creators. A few tips for you. So this is from Actuality, one of the founders of Actuality, um, Gabriella Campbell Gomez, who, um, who talked about uh, what works on TikTok. Uh, they, they've been on there uh, since about 2019. So strong visuals, the first three seconds are critical. Pretty much everyone talked to me about, you know, having to hook that attention at the beginning through a combination of, you know, words and multimedia images. Uh, simplicity of language. So this is really the trademark of actuality. So just always using a short word when uh, rather than a long word. Um, and, you know, that's not about dumbing down. That's just about being really, really clear. Be authentic. Be authentic to yourself. Be authentic to your brand. 
and then you know really trying to understand how that algorithm works so what are the what are the features that give your video the biggest chance of success and um, one of the things that they've done recently is up the volume so it used to be you know you would post maybe one two uh a day now they're up to around six a day and you know the view is the more you post the more chance you essentially have for one of those posts to go viral and it is very hit based you know you can have videos in the middle and then suddenly it will really sort of capture the um capture the attention um just briefly a little bit about metrics um so followers are obviously are important we've seen that in our data the the ones with the really big follower numbers obviously have a head start because um, more people are going to see it in their feeds um, but it isn't as big a factor on other platforms you can also get huge hits with uh, a brand that has zero followers uh, views are obviously the best metric for understanding how well a piece of content has done and whether it's getting traction and average views and the percentage that people get through uh, is also critical so complete rates here um, people are reluctant to talk about how, how good their their complete rate you know how much of a one minute video do people watch but um from talking to publishers you know if you get over half that's pretty good so if people are watching 30 seconds of a 60 second video for example and then the other factor that the algorithm takes into account apart from average view time which is critical it's also um the extent to which you like or comment or share because these also are signals that the algorithm uses to decide whether to show that video to, to more people. So these are kind of metrics that you might want to think about if you're working on TikTok. Um, and then uh, finally, um, uh, a lot of people are, uh, are on TikTok and we've tracked a lot of publisher attention, but I guess the big question is, is this resonating? Or do people actually not look at traditional media companies? Are they looking elsewhere? And um, this is a chart from our 2021 digital news report. So it's about 18 months old, this data, and it may have changed a bit. But what it shows is the difference that we found between Twitter and TikTok in terms of where people were paying attention. So in Twitter, people... Um, when it comes to news, people are mainly looking at mainstream news outlets and mainstream journalists. So as you know, they play a huge part in the debate, they shape the agenda, et cetera. But in TikTok, it's much more, the agenda is shaped much more by personalities, influencers, comedians, uh, film stars. You know, th this is where people, this is where the huge numbers are. And uh, we think that mainstream media organizations have increased their presence since then. But when it comes to news, that's that's really important to remember that actually it will be uh, personalities and influence or maybe ordinary people who uh, they're paying much more attention to. And that's one of the reasons why there's more concern about um, misinformation. So um, I, I did not do a sort of comprehensive look at this. I just basically talked to a few people um, who are not journalists but are creating news on TikTok, just to understand a little bit about the landscape. And uh, here are a few examples. So this is Matt Welland, who I, I didn't actually talk to, but I looked at his account. He has 2.6 million followers. So just for comparison, that's about four times as many followers as the BBC. Uh, he uh, tends to start every video with a very sensationalist uh, question. Um, I'm sorry, Russia... Uh, have just done what with a whole load of emojis uh, that one got 8.6 million this is about a nuclear submarine that went missing that everyone was worried about it turned up later but this was the that was the story another video began with world war three is literally about to break out so not surprising that some of these get um get clicks for example uh this is Kyle Khalil Green um who calls himself a Gen Z uh historian he was the first black student president at Yale and he's a part of a group of social media influencers who are, you know, questioning essentially what they were taught at school. And uh, one of his first videos, uh, which went viral and got over a million views, was about the whitewashing of, of Martin Luther King's legacy, for example. Uh, he's extremely thoughtful. Um, and um, he was also one of the influencers that the White House brought in recently after the invasion of Ukraine 
to essentially do a press conference with influencers. So, uh, you know, politicians and people who want to get their message out are increasingly using influencers to do that. And Khalil, Khalil's a good example. And then um, I also talked to what you might call a, uh, a news activist. Uh, this is Joss Reyes, who's an activist in Peru. And TikTok is huge in Peru. And one was one of the factors that brought down an interim president in 2020 during the student protests. And Joss was one of the... Uh, TikTok stars at the time who was um, out on the picket line shooting video and and, and talking about it. Um, and her videos are amazing. You know, they deal with really difficult subjects with a smile and humor and positivity um, and sense of activism, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, you know, she says that TikTok is, you know, for young people, it's just where you go. TV is boring. Uh, news media makes it difficult to understand. We go to TikTok to have someone explain what's going on of our own age. And it's much more fun. It's much more um, innovative. But she calls herself not a journalist. She calls herself an activist. So essentially, I guess the point is that journalists are uh, competing not just with other uh, other media companies, that they're, they're competing with news creators, um, with celebrities, and, and all the rest of it. So just finally, um, before we get into Q&A, um, just looking ahead, uh, it's early days and um, the platform is developing very fast. There's a lot of issues that publishers are worried about. Uh, so I asked all my interviewees to say what they would like TikTok to do differently to make a better environment for journalism. And uh, the first thing that they said was they wanted um, TikTok to give more prominence to reliable news sources uh, because misinformation has become a big big problem on the platform they feel there should be a better system of of um, credibility uh, especially around elections or stories like ukraine so how how these things are labeled uh, it's obviously a debate in tiktok as well in terms of verification but also some kind of um, some kind of a better way for people to work out what is what is true and what is not true, essentially. Uh, linked to that, transparency. Um, so TikTok removes a lot of content or, or it applies warning screens. The algorithm applies war warning screens to demonstrations, for example. Um, and publishers argue that a whole load of legitimate stories are being suppressed effectively, often for good reason, because TikTok wants to protect a younger audience. Um, but again, they, they argue that um, reputable publishers should be given more leeway. Monetization is, is, as I mentioned earlier, a huge issue, and it's one that's really holding back investment for a lot of people. Um, uh, and, and also, there's no opportunity to link out back to your website, uh, as you can do in, TikTok, in uh, Twitter or Facebook. So even indirect monetization is a problem. And then finally, um, publishers say they want... Um, better opportunities to understand how their content is being used so they can improve and optimize it. And that's not as good as other platforms. So a whole range of things that publishers would like TikTok to do differently. So that's just a sort of a, a roundup of, uh, of, of what we found. Um, I think really significant changes over the last year, uh, publishers really embracing the platform, or many of them are, many of them are still worried about uh, different aspects of TikTok uh, and where it's going. There's a lot of uh, experimentation going on. Uh, different approaches. There is no single way to be successful on, on TikTok. There are many ways to be successful on, on TikTok. Um, and uh, hopefully this report has given uh, some uh, interesting insights on some of the things that are working uh, now and some that might work in the future. Uh, so back to Federica. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, we already have a few questions. Um, if anyone has questions, there is a Q&A function on Zoom. So if you can put your question there uh, and I'll read them out um, to Nick. Uh, Nick, the first question is from um, Hans, um, who asks, what makes the Daily Mail so popular? Is it because they were early adapters or because they publish a lot and frequently? Uh, they certainly publish a lot, lot and frequently. I think the Daily Mail is a little bit different from some of the others. So I, I said earlier that, uh, you know, the qualification was that you were publishing news material. And a lot, if you look at the Daily Mail's uh, TikTok account, it's mainly entertainment content. But they obviously do cover, you know, news and they do explain us as well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> why is the Daily Mail successful on, uh, on online is because the um, the agenda is... is um, 
is, is popular essentially. Um, but it's, it's interesting if you look at the engagement levels, they, they also employ a sort of creator approach broadly. So, um, you know, a few young journalists who, who are sort of translating these stories into TikTok language, into the TikTok vernacular. Um, but the engagement on the Daily Mail is much lower than it is uh, for, from others. So um, it's, it's not necessarily the best example. Um, we actually have a question from Oriel um, on somehow also linked to that. So is it correct to say, asks Oriel, that a TikTok accounts with a newsroom-led approach perform better in terms of followers and engagement than the creator-led accounts? And how do publishers justify a creator-led approach if it doesn't perform as well? Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the if you look at the follow accounts, that's probably true. And and I think one of the ways in which the um, the broadcasters have done that is basically use their broadcast channels to say follow us on TikTok. So so actually that you know they've got that sort of um, that that reach advantage. But I think if you look at the, I mean just look at the um, uh, some some of the look at actuality for example, which is a creator led um, approach. And they have something like seven hundred thousand, and and are outperforming a lot of the um, a, a lot of the others that are just basically reversioning material. So as I say, I don't think there's a single best way of doing it. I think some of the creator approaches are working really, really well and connecting with people at a deep level, and some of the broadcast approaches um, I think are a bit more hit and miss. So so what you see as you look at them is that you may have some that go completely viral and suddenly get you know fifteen million. And then which one of the reasons that NBC did so well is because they had a couple of huge hits in there and then others will only get a few thousand. Whereas I think the creator led approach is more consistent, probably. Um, we have a question from Nathan um, about local news. Um, and I know there is, um, an, I think, one of the case studies in the report yeah. about regional um, publisher. And Nathan asks, um, what should local news outlets, should local news outlet be on TikTok? And he says he asked before because he understands that so much more traffic comes from the algorithm versus who people follow. So having content just targeting a small number of people may not make sense. Um, so what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a really interesting case study in the in the full report um, from Kleiner Zeitung, which is a, a regional newspaper in in Austria, and they, I think they were really smart. So they they follow a basically a creator led approach. So they've employed people under under 25, um, which is what a lot of local newspapers are doing, actually, somebody who really understands the platform and then just trying to match interesting stories in their paper and then turning it into content that they think would be useful. But in theory, the, um, the TikTok algorithm is really good at finding specific communities. So automatically, without you having to set up, you know, a Facebook group or something like that. So in theory, um, you know, it, it sort of, um, uh, the, the perfect piece of content should find people. And then if they see content from your local area and you like it and you're consuming it, they should give you more of it as you, as, as going forward. So I think it could be a really good approach uh, without having to put a huge amount of, uh, of effort in because the algorithm does a lot, of, a lot of the work for local. But there aren't many great examples. And obviously, when we're looking at the big accounts, you don't really see local in there, which is why I was keen to include one in, in, the, in the report itself. I'm going to sneak a question uh, of, of mine um, in there sure. and go back, to, and go back to the audience. Um, in the report, you also talk about um, a case study from Italy where it's a bit less of like a um, creators versus newsroom, but there is actually a, a, a publishers who partners with creators um, from um, Chow people in, in Italy um, and sort of like uses the creator approach, but with the publisher behind. Can you tell us a bit more about um, how they work with them? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so um, what uh, Chow people have said, it's the publisher of fan page as well. So it, it the, the company has this sort of real understanding of social media. And one of the things they were looking at was, you know, the the rise of the creator economy, if you like, and, and these very talented people who really understood how to communicate in new ways with young people. And they found Andrea Mochi, who's, um, who's the, um, who, who was basically a scientist and um uh, and they offered him and he was doing this on the side he was creating a really successful um ex explanatory um uh ex explanatory tiktok account and instagram account about um you know uh, geography and and um 
uh, you know, na natural events and, and science, and he called it Geopop. And they basically bought it and co-opted um, and uh, sort of creating, if you like, a vertical strategy, um, which may include other creators over time. Uh, that is doing what I just talked about with local. It's basically finding a community. And so it's a hugely successful account. Um, I can't remember the exact number, something like 400,000 um, uh, followers. And again, some of those some of those videos have really have really worked. And what Andrea says is, is that being part of that larger company is also really helpful because it's given him a lot more sort of support to develop the proposition and put in higher quality videos um, and, uh, you know, better explanations than he was able to do before and employ more people. So, again, I think it's an interesting way in which you might scale the, appro the uh, creator approach to two or three people, which is what Geopop's now about. Um, we have a question from Francisca um, about engagement, um, and she asks if you can talk a little bit more about audience engagement metrics. She says, how do we interpret views per post if it is unclear how much of a view needs to be watched to be counted as a view by completion rate, yeah. particularly since videos can vary greatly in length? Um, and then um, basically also they ask if you can talk about um, what publishers' views are on experiences on the algorithm curation, but um, mainly maybe first with the engagement metric. Question. Yeah, I think I think engagement metrics. I mean, the challenge with all of these metrics is to to get benchmarks and to know what good looks like in different circumstances. And so, you know, you 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 definitely, I think you can do this with your own data. Essentially, what you're doing is you're comparing the success of one video against another video in your own ecosystem because you you can't see anyone else's data and so you know you would say well let's look at all videos that we do of one minute long and then we'll, let's look at, at ones we do with four minutes long and then we can set a benchmark for those things to see which ones are working and then you kind of iterate and try and improve against that i think what other platforms have tried to do is provide guidance on sort of wider benchmarks but uh tiktok doesn't really do that yet uh, maybe that will mature over time and i know that a number of third party tools that are used are also about to or have started to integrate tiktok as well and will start to provide those benchmarks so that's that's a way in which i think those those things can help and i think you know like a lot of this stuff much of it is is using sort of common sense as well and uh, trying to draw out your own lessons some of which are qualitative and some of which are based on the data uh, in terms of the general algorithm um, I mean, there's there's a lot published about how the, the TikTok algorithm works, and it's not, you know headline level, it's not that complicated. Um, it's it's essentially if it engages people with time or with shares or with comments or with likes, then then uh, it gets shown to more people, and if it engages those people, it gets shown to more people, and that and that's when virality happens. And it's a very you know pure and simple algorithm in 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 that respect. Um, Mafabana has a question that actually I had, so thank you so much for asking that. Um, so you talk about one of the things that, um, you know, publishers thinking about the future is better monetization options, but what are the current monetization options for publishers? Well, I mean, for publishers, there are virtually none at the moment. So, so if, if you're in, if you're in short video mode, which is where most people are, you know, producing videos of about a minute. Uh, there's no, there's no, there's no advertising. So no advertising revenue. It's a cost, basically. It's marketing. It's brand marketing. And your hope is that you're going to, you know, for for example, the Economist uh, is hoping that as it engages young people and they get to know the brand, at some point, maybe in ten years' time, they'll become an Economist publisher. So it's a very indirect link to to monetization. Um, if you're a creator, if you're a news creator, i.e. not a publisher, then you can get some monetization from what's called the news for the, called the creator fund. Um, and there are various qualifications for that. You need to have more than, I think, 10,000 uh, followers, for example. Um, and but the creators I talked to said that the, the money they get from that is really very small indeed. So that even when you have a lot of views, you're not really getting enough money. So it's not as good as uh uh, YouTube's, for example. And then the other one that people are sort of starting to play around with is um, within feeds uh, sponsored content. So essentially, you will get um, brands using the Washington Post have started to do this. Uh, so a separate team produces branded content for an airline or whatever, and that goes out. So there's revenue attached to that. Actuality have also started looking for sponsors 
uh, and and others are looking for sponsors to do content. So uh, I think um, Nexo Journal in Brazil, who I was talking to, they were looking for a sponsor for World Cup content, for example. So a big sponsor, and it would just have a brought to you by as part of, um, of of a deal for for the for the World Cup. So there are a few sort of sponsor content models emerging, and over time. Uh, you know, there may be uh, advertising models that TikTok in, introduce as well, but there's no sort of, there's no link back apart from in your bio, you can't link back to content out of TikTok because they want to keep you there. So it's it's actually an even worse deal than Twitter and Facebook. Um, we have many questions, so I'll try to go um, through uh, as many and get a bit of a, a different range of different questions. Um, Ines is asking, is there a difference between content made with real people and with motion graphics like we see in other platforms? Um, I don't know about that. I'm not sure I've studied it enough. I think what's interesting, so people talk a lot about uh, when they talk about real people, um, and they talk a lot about you know the authenticity of the platform and so we see that for example in eyewitness reports uh, journalist reports that's one way in which you can do that another way in which you can can use real people is to build that relationship with with dave jorgensen for example of of, of the washington post so you you know you, that's that's why the creator approach is, is 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 being used um and then um but graphics also work i mean you know if you look at a lot of those um if you look at a lot of the geopop uh um when they're trying to explain you know complex they try and mix the personality and the face with uh really really uh whizzy 3d graphics for example to explain this stuff um and it's a really good compressed way of doing it because if you only have a few minutes to do it then 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 actually combining those so I, i'm not sure it's an either or i think it depends on what you're trying to do essentially um valerie is asking um during your interviews with publishers, um, had some of them made experimentation on Snapchat a few years ago, obviously, and do we know if that helped them engage younger generation with their brands in the longer term? So I guess the question is, was there anything with, you know, is the approach of going on new platforms and learning to be learning about how to engage with younger audiences, does it then help you um, more broadly to engage with a younger audience in different platforms? Have anyone mentioned any lessons on Snapchat for that, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, th I think um, I think there's a difference between the sort of what we might call first generation um, social networks that sort of started in the desktop age and and the more visual uh, social networks. And I think one of the challenges for a lot of publishers is making that transition. So I would put sort of Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok in the same bucket, partly because they're quite sort of video led or, or picture led. Um, but also because they're sort of really mobile first. And I think publishers who've experimented with those definitely see a synergy. And one of the things that's interesting going back um, is that uh, the experimentation on TikTok is actually now playing back into Instagram um, reels and YouTube shorts. So essentially some of the things they're working, you know, original, one, one of the things that people said to me during this was TikTok, videos are different you have to produce them for tiktok and they won't work anywhere else but then a whole load of other people said actually tiktok videos are working really well on instagram reels and youtube shorts and you can kind of reversion them the other way around um and then just finally on on snapchat specifically i think there are a number of publishers that i mean most publishers haven't really engaged that much on on snapchat but there are some like the sun for example in the uk popular um outlet that has really successful snapchat channel and has definitely learned lessons from Snapchat that it's um, it, it's putting back on. It's again, it's hugely successful on TikTok, um, even though it's not putting huge amounts of effort into it. And part of that is just the learning process they've been through. Um, a couple of quick people are asking about getting the presentation or the recording. You'll find a recording in the next newsletter in all our social accounts afterwards, and a full report is on the website. And uh, Matt. Um, from a comms teams posted the link to it. Um, so you can find it that. Um, Nick, Emma asks, asks if a mixture of creator-led and newsroom-led in the same account is a bad idea, would it look inconsistent? Is it better to stick to one or the other? Uh, uh, yeah, broadly, I think consistent. I mean, that's one of the things people say, yeah, consistency. I think consistency of branding, consistency of approach um, helps the, un the algorithm understand what 
what to expect. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, you can't have a creator led approach. And then, I mean, there are many, many publishers break that rule, by the way, <laughs> you know, they, they put all, all kinds of things in, in their feed. Um, and, and some of the work, some of them are putting in things, you know, so you've got this really authentic report um, and then you suddenly put in a, a sponsored post or you put a trailer for a television program. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. Um, but my gut feel is you want to have people want to know what to expect. And I also think that while we're on this, the, the question of branding and brand consistency is crucial. You saw how good it was for The Economist, for example, uh, Afton Posten in, uh, sorry, Afton Blooded in, in uh, Sweden, um, you know, really puts a lot of effort into taking the videos outside, uh, editing them in a different package to give them much more branding. You know, they're sort of classic black and yellow. And it really cuts through, I think, in a in 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 a in a powerful way. And you can do that obviously across different platforms. And I think that's I think attribution, if you're not getting money, you might as well get attribution. I think that's something that publishers should really think about. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, we have a few people in the audience joining from African newsrooms. Um, one question is about um, saying that African newsrooms are late adopters on TikTok. Um, do you have any hope that they would catch up and leverage the platform for growth or monetization? And, and I guess maybe linked to it is someone who works for a nonprofit um, supporting journalists in rural parts of Africa. And how do you best think they can use TikTok in their work? Um, they say TikTok is given a hard time to get started. It feels a bit overwhelming to create content. So what are your hopes for Africa in general yeah. in newsroom and supporting um, journalists? I mean, first, just to say, we only have three African countries in the digital news report. So of, of what we looked at was just Nigeria, Kenya and South Africa. Um, but what we found is um, is not that much activity. There was one large one in, in Nigeria, Pulse, which I think is also operates in, in Uganda and is quite effective. But I think part of the problem in Africa is obviously sort of bandwidth and video bandwidth and data charges are, are a completely different level to say how they are in Latin America or, or Asia. And that's one of the constraints around around uh, multimedia content. Having said that, Nigeria, you know, uh, TikTok is pretty big in Nigeria, actually, and it's just not apparently used very much for news. So, it, you know, what's so fascinating is that in different parts of the world, you can have the same platform that is used much more intensively for news or much less intensively for news. And that obviously partly is to do with culture. It's partly to do with what other networks are available and, and you know, what, um, what where creators are putting their effort. So I think in, I, you know, I think a lot of this is timing, keeping your eye on it and saying, where are your audience? Is this relevant to me or not? And if it's not relevant, then, you know, uh, focus on something else for now. Um, there are a couple of questions about teams, um, both in terms of like, do you know how big these teams are? Um, and related to that, in the creator-led approach, and do you have any data on whether having one or two creator hosts um, is is better versus um, just multiple hosts and multiple faces in the creator approach? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think obviously the danger of having one creator is that that creator gets <laughs> stolen. <laughs> By your competitor, um, uh, so I think most people are kind of moving away from that and try and provide, uh, you know, a couple. Of, you know, the Washington Post, which you know had just one, really has recently expanded as a team of three, for example. Um, a lot of the creator-led teams, you saw the LA Times had about sort of seven or eight. They've sort of made a major investment in in experimentation, essentially. Um, typically, it would be, I guess, two, three, four. Um, but yeah, te teams of, 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 of different sizes of, 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 of creators, but I would say focusing on one person is probably not a good idea in the long term. And I guess, Amanda, this also should also answer your question, which was a, a different version of the same. Um, Darren is asking, how are public service news organizations managing some of the brand impartiality challenges they might have on TikTok, um, which digital native organization might not have? Um, I mean, firstly, public service broadcasters are generally much more cautious. So many of them um, are not on TikTok or have only gone on TikTok with, say, uh, children's brands. A lot of the Nordics, for example, uh, haven't put their main brands on, though they're, they're kind of considering it. Um, and I think some of that is to do with that fear that 
it's not possible to tell a story, a complete story in an impartial way in a minute. On the other hand, um, how long is a television package? You know, a television package is probably, um, when I was working in television, it was about one minute 20 and it was 58 seconds at weekends. So not very different from TikTok ones. So I, I actually think those things are probably overdone. I think the, the biggest concerns for public broadcasters is um, data security. You know, they have a very high bar on the, on the extent to which they um, they 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 need to build that trust around data with with uh, anyone who uses their services. And there's a lot of worry about where that data is actually being processed and what the potential is for that data at some stage to be used or go back to China or be used by Chinese authorities. So that's um, that's definitely a worry. And that's one of the reasons why. So I think there's a number of different reasons impartiality being one but there's lots of examples of public broadcasts being on it i mean in, again in there's a case study of uh, ard uh which tagesschau which is uh germany's public broadcaster which is one of the first was in 2019 and it's very successful and you know really tries to um explain the news in an impartial way and i think has found some great examples of how to do that um there's a question about longer form and what sort of content works better in long form like four minutes for example I, it's quite early to say because um you know it's only recently that tiktok sort of has has increased the length uh i think now to 10 minutes um but what um what some of the publishers say is that they're broadly experimenting with so the washington post for example is doing a lot more longer videos and it's saying that actually the TikTok quite like the, the algorithm quite likes them and I, I suspect that why TikTok are doing this is partly to compete with YouTube but partly to open up advertising opportunities because you can't put you can't really put ads in front of a minute long video but you could put an ad in the middle of a 10 minute one as YouTube and others have, have done so I think that's really where they're heading uh, so I don't think it's just about what works. I think it's also commercial motivations behind that. Um, but yes, both the Washington Post and Geopop actually said that some of their longer videos, and they put them all out, uh, all, a lot of the YouTube ones they cut to eight minutes or whatever, are working really well in TikTok as well. Um, there's a question about, do we have any relevant data on referral traffic from TikTok? Any publisher is, there is seeing none. any? Because there is no link. In, there is no there's link. No, so it's just the bio link. But... Um, off, off your main off, off your main bio um and obviously that's a problem for publishers but it's also a problem if you're trying to create uh campaigns with brands for example because they're not going to put sponsored posts if they can't track the effectiveness back to you know a holding page or whatever so i i suspect that, that will change and that there will be more uh you know over time tiktok will open up some of those commercial possibilities um, we only have one minute left, and I wanted to um, ask um, one final question. Of course, you know, different strategies will play differently for different publishers in the overall other strategies of where, how they are approaching platforms, etc. cetera. Um, but if uh, there was a publisher in the group listening now, what questions, uh, and, and they are not on TikTok yet, what kind of questions should they ask themselves in order to decide if they should be on TikTok or not? Are there any things that they should consider in making this decision? Um, I, th I mean, I think the primary one is um, what, what audience are you trying to reach? And if you're, uh, you know, how significant is the uh is your need to show that you are engaging younger audiences. That's that's one of the reasons, obviously, that public broadcasters should be looking at TikTok, for example, because they're obviously losing, finding it hard to, to, to reach people directly through websites or, or television or radio. If you're a subscription publisher where essentially, um, you know, your sustainability is built on people over the age of 35, um, it's probably not a priority for you right now. So you might say, well, let's do a bit of experimentation um, to, you know, make sure we understand vertical video or start a conversation or start a relationship. And I think that's what you're seeing with a, with, with a lot of other publishers. So I, 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 I think, you know, as with so much, a lot of this goes back to, to, to your audience and your overall strategy and your focus, because it is simply not possible to do everything in the digital world. You have to focus, you have to decide what the big trends are. And, and the, the point I would leave you with is the 
even if you're not interested in the audience, the reason why you should take TikTok seriously is because it's affecting the whole ecosystem. That sort of move towards um, making vertical video work and new storytelling techniques, which are hopefully we've illustrated in this report, I think are going to be important for every publisher on their own websites and through distributed content. Thank you so much. There is a last comment, um, which I'm just going to read out. That Darren says, um, terrifically insightful and um, as useful as ever. So thanks, Darren. And thank you so much, uh, Nick, for sharing the insights. Um, for everyone, you can find the full report uh, on the link we're posting on the chat or on our homepage. And you can, uh, you'll be able to rewatch and share with others that you think might be interested in this um, discussion, uh, the recording of this um, webinar, which you also be finding on our website or on our newsletters um, where you can sign up from um, our homepage. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for sharing these insights. Um, with us. All right. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the great questions. Thank Cheers. you, everyone. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye.